The next selection is Maine's Black Future, conceptualized and created by Genius Black for the Maine Monitor. Black Future. My name is Genius Black. And I am Angela Okafo. And you are listening to Maine's Black Future. More from Genius and Angela in a moment. But now, a story from Maine's unique Black history. Gerald Edgerton Talbot was born in Bangor, Maine in the year 1931. He had four other siblings, of which he was the eldest. They represent the eighth generation of their family born in Maine. Gerald, called Jerry by some, grew up in Bangor and attended Bangor High School. Later, he married Anita Cummings, making her Talbot in 1954. Mr. Talbot's biography in Americans Who Tell the Truth, a collection or portraits and biographies, states, quote, After serving in the Army and marrying Anita Cummings, Talbot and his wife settled down in Portland, Maine. Finding a job in housing proved difficult for a black family in Portland, but eventually Jerry began a career as a printer for Maine's largest newspaper as he and Anita, who also worked, raised their four daughters. The challenging times provided them with determination and fight against prejudice and oppression in all forms. End quote. That's from Americans Who Tell the Truth. Then, while still working as a printer, Gerald attended the 1963 March on Washington, D.C., which has stayed with him. Mr. Talbot became a well-known activist and was eventually convinced to put his energy into starting a Portland, Maine chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In 1964, he became the founding president of Portland's NAACP, where he worked to effect change supporting the Maine Fair Housing Bill and the Maine Human Rights Act. Mr. Talbot continued to expand his influence, supporting the state of Maine at higher levels. He ran for a spot as a Maine state representative and in 1972 became Maine's first African-American legislator. In this capacity, he sponsored impactful bills addressing issues such as gun control and gay rights. Representative Talbot also led the charge on legislation to remove the word from maps and place names in Maine as it was offensive and completely outdated, except to legislators who fought to retain the name out of respect to history. In 1977, Representative Talbot sponsored a bill, Legislative Document Number 1661. During discussion of the bill on the floor, Talbot said, quote, there was a lot of misunderstandings about the legislation and feelings ran high, end quote, from Maine's Visible Black History, The First Chronicles of Its People by H.H. H. Price and Gerald E. Talbot. In response to legislators who spoke against document number 1661, Talbot answered, quote, the name is also historic as far as I'm concerned. No one in this body was brought up underneath that name, and I still carry scars from that name, and my children carry the scars of that name. I have had to fight over that name. If you use that name today, you are going to get by with it. If you use it any other time, I'm going to challenge you, as I have in the past. End quote. From Maine's Visible Black History. The bill passed by overwhelming majority and became Maine law soon after. Legislate. To perform the function of legislation. To make or enact laws. To make laws. Legislature. Specifically, an organized body having authority to make laws for a political unit. You, listening. 
might be in one of those units. The word legislator is rooted in the Latin lex and legis, meaning law, and later, meaning proposer, so literally a proposer of laws. Jerry Talbot proposed legislation on fair housing, recognizing Martin Luther King Jr. Day as a state holiday, and conditions for migrant workers. And after the legislature, he served on the Maine State Board of Education. I can't take adequate time to touch the breadth of Gerald Talbot's impact on the state of Maine. I encourage you to research him further. Blessings to Mr. Talbot and his amazing family. He is a shining example of a black man who has and continues to influence and shape the state of Maine. Think about that as you consider Maine's unique black history and as we create Maine's black future. Connecting the state of Maine's rich black history to black change makers weaving Maine's black future today. I'm back today and I'm talking to Angela Okafor, a dynamic problem solver, attorney, and realtor. She is a dedicated mother and a talented fashion designer. She was the first person of color and first immigrant elected as Bangor City Councilor. She received a Juliet Award from the Girl Scouts of Maine, and she has also received Trailblazer Awards for her work with both immigrant and Penobscot communities. She was named one of Maine Biz's Women to Watch and one of Bangor Daily News's 10 Politicians to Watch. She is also the Community Engagement Director for the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial indigenous, and Maine tribal populations. I'm excited to share her inspiring and evolving story with y'all. I'd like to start with, where are you from? I am from Nigeria. Where in Nigeria? Specifically Enugu in Anambra State is the southeastern part of Nigeria. Right on. My little brother just came back from visiting Nigeria. He told me I have to go there and I believe him. What you, I should go to Nigeria? Oh, definitely. Okay. Okay. If she said no, I would be like, what? (laughs) Absolutely. You want to go to Nigeria? You want to go to the Southeast? Yeah. You want to eat the food, dance to the rhythms? I definitely do. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely do. Um, You came, from my understanding, from Nigeria to Bangor. Yes. Right? And this was in 2006. Officially 2006, but I was back and forth until 2008. What was that like? I was still in school. I was finishing up my law school in Nigeria. So I was going back and forth until I finished my law school and then settled in in 2008. And it was a lot of culture shock. Um, I don't like cold. I still don't. I mean, I live with it, but I still don't. It was very boring. It was There was a lot of loneliness. Mm. Um, I mean, I didn't know what depression was then, but I'm pretty sure I probably had some. Yeah, it's real, yeah. Because then I could very hardly see any person that wasn't white, at least in Bangor then. Um, there were no services. Um, I didn't have friends. I couldn't walk then. I could only leave but not walk then. I didn't have children then either. Mm. So it was... It was pretty lonely. It was. I heard that. How did you know that you wanted to land in Maine? I mean, because when you say going back and forth, obviously Maine was already on the map for you. It wasn't a choice, really. Mm, okay. Of a choice. The father of my children mm-hmm. was through a professional recruitment that we came. I always like to go back and put my mind in that time frame, 2006, 2008. And I looked up some facts. One thing that blew my mind, in America, the average price of gas at that time was $2.59 per gallon in 2006. Yeah, I don't even have to explain how different that is. Another thing that I found out 
just looking back to place myself in that time frame, that was back when Google purchased uh, YouTube, which was a really big thing. I think they bought it for $1.65 billion. Um, it's worth a whole lot more now, like closer to $30 billion. There was also the year, um, I'm a science person, and I grew up loving space, and I always remember that one of the planets was called Pluto. Mm-hmm. That was the year that the International Astronomical Union decided that Pluto was not a planet, it was a dwarf planet, and I always felt sad for Pluto because it was a, used to be a whole planet. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Could you imagine losing your planet status? Yeah. No, nah, I can't really, but I'm also not a planet. So uh, that placed me in the time. So when you finished school, 2008, law school, because I know that the licensing of kind of what you could practice or what could happen didn't exactly align the way you wanted it to. Talk to us a little bit about that. So coming here, of course, uh, I started researching what I could do. And I one of the first things I saw was, um, Maine, if you are coming from a country that the law is based on the uh, English common law, mm-hmm. you could apply with a transcript and then your transcript will be evaluated for equivalency. Uh, to an, an American acquired law degree. Another state that I saw that I could do that was New York. So when you asked about choice, the two options we had actually was New York and Maine. Hmm. So you know how on the map you see New York, you see Maine side by side. That's what it looks like, yeah. No, actually, our option was Washington, D.C., actually, and Maine. But, of course, everybody knew New York. So, you know how on the map you see New York, you see Maine, and it looks like they are so close. So, we thought, oh, we could always, you know, stroll to New York and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> stroll to New York. Exactly. Yeah, 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 from southern Maine. Yeah, so, uh, until we landed. So, uh, the plan initially, too, was, you know, get our papers and then move to New York. So, I felt I had two options. Apply to New York and apply to Maine. I applied, I sent my transcript to the New York, just like I did to the Maine board. And before I knew it, uh, New York reached back out that after the evaluation of my transcript, Mm -hmm. they deemed me qualified to apply for the New York bar exam, which I went and did that same 2009 uh, in New York and uh, Maine. Return back requesting extra um, details of the courses I did over the course of six years of studying law in Nigeria, which the schools are always, you know, they send the transcripts. So we went back and forth. That couldn't be, I couldn't get that. Hmm. So I, at that first year, I eroded me. And then I ended up, I did, took the New York bar exam and I passed it in one sitting months after arriving. Okay. Uh, that is to show you the similarities between the Nigerian law legal system and the, you know, I couldn't have been able to do that within months if there wasn't a lot of similarities. Absolutely. So I got licensed in New York. Living in Maine, I still up till this day, it's still a battle being able to um, looking over, you know, finding ways to bridge that gap, which is part of what led me to advocacy in my life. Got you. Can I ask you, you passed the, the bar exam in New York, and I'm just curious, did you, I mean, did you practice law? Did you, I mean, talk to me about that. So with my la- New York license, I could practice federal law anywhere in the country. Okay. So with that, that is why I started practicing immigration, which is federal uh, law. Actually, I wanted to do um, immigration and bankruptcy. But for bankruptcy, I have to be admitted at the federal courts where I intend to practice. So I went to the federal courts in Bengal to be admitted. But no, if I'm not licensed in Maine, I can't be admitted into the federal court. Got it. So. All right. Details, details. Yeah. Right. And so you were saying that that led you to advocacy. Yeah. Talk to us about that. So, of course, I I started reaching out to people. This is what I want. This is what I want because I'm really, I don't know how to stay idle. 
And I know that I really wanted to do what I wanted to do, at least what I went to school and spent six years to study. Hey, Uh, (laughs) I can dig it. Yeah. So I started talking to people and sharing my stories one on one from that end to, you know, one other thing happened, another reason to tell my story. So from telling my story on a on a, a lower stage to telling it on a medium stage, to telling it on a little bit of a higher stage. That was how it all started as to how can it be possible that people who come to Maine are actually able to have opportunities to do what they want to do. Absolutely. What were you advocating for? I was basically advocating for an opportunity to be able to practice law in the state of Maine. Um, Because for me, not to be bragful, but from history I've heard, it's arguable that New York bar is the most difficult. I mean, California will argue that. And for me to have come and passed it in one sitting within months of arrival when I was still struggling to even actually understand American English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, You know, and a lot of people questioned And a lot of people up till today still question the capability of foreign graduates, the fact that I was able to do that, and the fact that New York and Maine, I did the courses Maine requires, and even more in New York. I feel that there should be a way to make it so that it's possible for people to at least have a chance. This is not saying... People shouldn't have, like, you know, to get a free pass, no, to have an opportunity to at least try. Yes. Got it. No, I understand. And were you able to affect change as you were advocating in this way? Change is is a marathon, actually. It's not a sprint. Uh, I believe that they are not just me. I wouldn't say it was just me. Mm -hmm. Of course, over time, the, you know, we started to gather momentum and more and more people started to see what was going on and what needed to happen. And of course, with the need of work, uh, with the workforce shortage in the state and all of that, People now, I mean, there was a uh, there was a bill that went in last session, even though it didn't finally pass. But you know, efforts are. That is why I said is a is a marathon. Uh, yes. Moving the the blocks one inch at a time, but at least people, there's a lot of conversations right now about uh, international uh, equivalency, not just within the legal uh, field, but generally. Me capturing these conversations with dynamic people like herself are important because we want to demonstrate to y'all, even people that are brilliant, people that have uh, great linguistic skills, tons of knowledge, you can still run into these technicalities and get 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 kind of pushed out, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think it was important that you were advocating in that way. But I, I also think it's it's important for people to recognize that you kind of ended up doing something different because that just, it's slowly happening, but it didn't open up And the other thing I'll say, too, I just want to say it out loud. America is not the only country with smart people. America is not the only nation with really intelligent, brilliant people. We can move on. So it was um, a course I I put together, uh, a comparative analysis of the American criminal legal system and the Nigerian criminal legal system. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so you wrote that for a class that you were and teaching. I, I, I taught that, yes. I imagine that was fascinating. But then I couldn't get admitted. Okay, so to move forward for you, I like how you said, I, I didn't want to be idle, and I knew that I wanted to do what I want to do. Talk to me a little bit about, I know you, there's other things that you've done. So when I came to Bangor, of course, I came with a beautifully braided hair in Nigeria, but by the time I needed to get it out, there was no other place to get it. So I was lonely, I was bored, I was not doing anything, which is typically not me. So, of course, on my head, I started learning how to braid on my own head. Mm. Um, So that was how I learned how to braid, which I finally turned into a business because there was a need for that in my community. Then um, along the line, I started up an international market because... 
It wasn't just that I, I had to travel to Boston, to uh, Massachusetts to get food stuff, but I saw also that need in my community because people will come in before you know it, they are living. And I wanted these people to stay. So it was like, okay, one of the things that was making them move out of town was food stuff. Yes. So I said, okay, I, it's not like I don't need it either. So I could use one stone and kill two beds, right? Yeah, yeah, Provide yeah. Provide yeah. for myself and get people to stay too. So that was how the international market came. Apart from the fact, of course, I couldn't get a job too. I couldn't get a decent job. Right. So it was, okay, I started this. My kids too were young. And of course, being a young mother with no family here. So I had to find ways to walk around what I had. Yes. Then when I started that need, of course, I was selling some African fabrics. The need came like, oh, if we buy, where do we sew? I'm like, oh, okay. So I learned by myself how to sew. Okay. Not that I can sew very high fashion, <laughs> but at least I can whip, whip out something really decent. Nice. So I learned how to sew. Then I also started an immigration law practice. I just wanted to say this before we go on to that, because next is immigration law. I noticed you said in my community, and I think particularly as black people in Maine, there's these different communities that we're part of. But you also have something that you're referring to when you say my community. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So when I talk about my community, I meant not just the brother Bengal area community, but mostly people who look like myself, because I felt that most of the services that we needed to stay there and happy and, you know, uh, be able to afford what we needed were not provided for. So I, I knew that was a need. And the way my brain works is I see a need. The next thing is what is the solution, sir? So, right on. But when that solution also provides a means for me, so it's like a win-win. So. Of that too. You're advocating for yourself as you kind of advocate and build for others. Exactly. And that also gave me an opportunity to get a wider community, actually. I started from wanting to provide for my community more like people who looked like me because that was all I knew. Mm hmm I ended up cre like creating a bigger community. For example, people with their struggles, especially like different categories. But the one that kind of really got me into my elements a little bit was uh, finding white parents that had black kids, mm -hmm. one struggling with their children and not what to do or how to support them. Black children that were adopted by white parents uh, some of a couple of them ending up ending up on the streets and just stumbling into my store and wanting to vent, mm. and you know, so it was it gave me that opportunity. I realized that they come to me sometimes. I had no clue what to say to them, and then one person came, two, three. So I was like, oh, you know, there are more than you know people enough that we could put heads together so it made me led me to creating a, a group a, a support affiliation group on social on facebook what bengal area white parents of black kids mm. recently when covid hit too uh, when i had uh, a huge health struggle and then i had a story about a nigerian lady in new jersey that died and nobody knew for days because of course she was all by herself mm. nobody knew she was she tested positive and the next thing people knew she was dead. So I kind of panicked because, you know, for me, I felt like there are so many of us here and most people may not even know the next person. Like, what if, you know? Mm. So that spurred me into doing something I had been postponing and postponing, starting up a, another group, uh, Bengal Area Africans. So that brought brings together... Africans from anywhere that lives in Bengal area, which we just had our first get together successfully beyond our expectation last December. I love that. I love to hear the success, but also just the motion. And I, I want to highlight again, I know that when we talk about like black folks and, and African folks, it, you know, here in Maine, because we are here in Maine, People t tend to hear a lot of the divisiveness because we say black or African, but reality, we are here and we might not be the exact same as everyone. So sometimes creating spaces that feel good for us, creating these things we can hang on to, eat good food, culturally appropriate fruit, food, listen to music that we love and share with people is really important. And, you know, I'll just quickly harken back. 
I had Adila Muhammad on this show. And so when I had Adila, Adila here, one of the things when she talked about the third place and some of the work she does in the community, why it, there's this niche and where it really fits to support mm-hmm. black and brown people. And it's because at jobs, you can have DEI officers, mm-hmm. you can have uh, whatever, you can have success with DEI, right? We talk about people who fail, you can have success and still have black employees and leaders who leave that job the next year. Mm-hmm. Not because they hated it, but because even if your job's going well, your sense of community doesn't come from your job. It comes from where you live and where you go to church and who you dance with and who you mm-hmm. vent to when you need to. And that's not always at work. So there's this these critical spaces in our community, both physical spaces and virtual spaces, occupied by black people because we need it to be there. So I just want our audience to know that when you hear about that, that's not weird. That's not bad. And people aren't trying to be divisive. They're just trying to be okay. But I will also add, I mean, currently in Maine, we have a ton of white allies. A lot of, you know, that have become and keep being aware and learning, you know, how to support people like you and I. And, you know, I like to always give credit where it's due. So it's always too important to mention that, yes, right now we have a lot of very conscious people learning and supporting and doing the work. Absolutely. Putting in real work. One of the things that I want to move forward to, I'm excited to to talk to you and hear you talk about it a little bit for our audience. I want you to talk a little bit about how you've been recognized and how you've been honored. So when you say honored, I look at it different ways. I I have been very much honored to be the first person of color and first immigrant to be on the Bengal City Council. Uh, I have been honored with several awards and recognitions. I have been honored to be a mother to three children. Hey. But I would say that my biggest honor has been the community support that I got uh, when... Um, so in 2019, like we talked about, I, I became an American citizen. Mm-hmm. And uh, my first election I participated in was for myself. I, I was honored to uh, have won historically. And um, we got into the work. And then the next thing, the pandemic hit. Uh, the next thing I was, um, I had my carpet pulled right underneath my feet personally you know, that triggered several health struggles. Yeah. And um, being here in Bangor, Maine, no family, right? No blood family. It was just me and my kids. And um, my, fa- my, my community, people that, you know, I argued on with on council, people I thought, you know, uh, yeah. of course, you know how those kind of heated arguments get because I brought to cancel so many things that were not there before. So, of course, yes. people usually uh, fight against change. Yep. So, um, the way they rallied around me, even up till today, people I don't even know, you know, I um, remember passing out at um, and being taken to the hospital and, you know, it became very complicated. And the next thing I knew, some people were setting food, uh, food chain some people were raising money to make sure I was being treated. Some people were taking turns, driving me back and forth hospital. People were taking turns, ensuring my kids went to school, got back, sending their children to make sure my kids had their homework done. Mm. That is the biggest honor of my life. Absolutely. Mm. That my community came back to me, came together uh, despite our differences. And that makes me want to, keeps me on my feet to want to always give back because for me, I felt honored that these people stood up for me, you know, especially when they had nothing absolutely to gain by doing that. So I feel I owe it to my community to give back. Mm -hmm. And that is what keeps motivating me towards things that I keep doing. I really find your story, this part of your story, so inspiring. I know what it's like to be at a board meeting or whatever, something official, and you're telling someone something, and they don't want to hear it. And I know why they don't want to hear it, and I'm bringing the heat with it anyway. But, you know, when you say, yeah, but those are some of the people that were supporting me in my time of need, 
That is what it's about. There's a lot of things that happen to create change. You know, sometimes you got to go home and get some rest and sometimes you get knocked off your feet. So for me, when I hear you talk about the level of support involving your kids, that's when we're vulnerable. No, no parent likes to be sick when you got to take care of your kids. So for me, I just find it inspiring. It makes me shout out Bangor. Shout out yeah. Bangor, yo. Yeah. You know, um, nah, that's love. But let me ask you this. Are there any other ways that you've been recognized or honored in recent years? I mean, I've, I've, I've been honored by the Girl Scout of Maine. I've been honored as uh, uh, with the Juliet Award. I've been honored um, by the Empower uh, as the Trailblazer Award recipient by the Empower the Immigrant Women. I have been given the same honor too by the Penobscot County Health Center, the dental uh, residents that year also uh, honored me with a Trailblazer Award. I have been honored also by the Food and Medicine as a Community Solidarity Award awardee. I've been recognized by the Main Bees as a woman to watch. I've been uh, recognized, I've been honored by the Main Women's Fund as a Call to Action uh, Award recipient. I have also been honored by as being by being named one of the 10 politicians to watch. Okay. I think 2019 or so, or 20 or something by yeah. the BDN. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've been pretty much honored in so many different ways that I can't even really, I mean, I have young kids, you know, young girls reaching out and sharing how much what I represent mean to them. And sometimes I don't even remember, like, you know, I became very sick and out of the spotlight and all of that. Mm. I still go to the mall and someone is like checking me out. And then she was like, oh, why didn't you run again? I'm like, I thought I've been forgotten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know me? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I would say that most times those minor, in, quote unquote, insignificant recognitions even mean a lot more. Thank you for sharing. Um, what I want to move forward into, I just give you a chance to let us know a little about what are you working on right now? Uh, and what are you working on that you're excited about? You know, I always say, and kind of it goes as if it's a joke sometimes, but I believe that if I was, if, if I went to test today, I'm sure I will be living with ADHD diagnosis <laughs> because I easily get bored doing one thing. So I kind of, have to reinvent myself one way or another. I have to add something, rotate it, and, you know, okay. just to keep that energy up. And the excitement is what keeps me going. And also when I'm making positive impact and seeing the results. Also, I'm, I think I'm, I feel I'm gifted with seeing needs. And the way I feel, this is part of what I'm learning about myself recently. The way my brain seems to work is, okay, there's a problem. My mind is not going on the other processes. The next thing I'm seeing is the end result, like what can be done? Like, you know, problem, solution, problem, solution. So so um, apart from not losing sight of the fact that I, I still want to practice what I labored for six years to do, I also believe that I I'm at my best when I'm advocating on whatever level, which brings me back to my law. So recently I found out that I actually could practice in the tribal courts, mm. potentially. So that is an, an opportunity that I'm exploring right now. Also, I just got my real estate license. I'm affiliated. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Yeah. <laughs> I am uh, I'm affiliated to the Realty of Maine, the Bengal office, uh, exploring real estate right now. All right. And I know some of y'all thinking about buying homes. All right. We'll come back to that. The thing is, I, I understand what you mean. Um, you're a passionate person, but you do want to mix it up. But you also bring multiple skills to bear. That's something that everyone doesn't have. So that's confusing to them or it seems unsettled. But for you, you're like, I'm, I'm trying to stay in it. But also, like you said, you know where you want to go. 
which is practicing law. You're trying to make that happen the way that you need it to happen. But you're not going to sit back and do nothing. You're going to no. keep impact. Yeah, see, so I'm just saying, I love it. Also, I'm currently the acting director for community engagement with the Permanent Commission. Um, the Permanent Commission. The Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous, and Tribal Populations of Maine. And what does this Permanent Commission do? The Permanent Commission is a child of status that has been mandated by law to go into the system, examine it, and find disparities that keep people like yourself and myself down from um, succeeding and then find ways to uh, elevate those disparities. We do those by primarily um, engaging the community, and uh, which is what I led, the area that I lead. And then we have a research department that does their own, uh, you know, research magic uh, to uh, match what exists in, in data with what actually exists in our communities. And then we have a policy uh, department that works with the uh, legislature uh, to put those findings and those solutions into policies and laws. And we have been mandated, uh, we have the power to also advise the three arms of government and to also uh, initiate bills. So that's more like the synopsis of what the Permanent Commission is. So, I mean, it sounds well-rounded and it's about actually creating and changing policy. Exactly. But those policies, those changes are primarily informed by the community. And that's what I was going to say, like those mechanisms where you're gathering feedback and then you're doing research and you're implementing policy. That's how you get things done. Exactly. So this is a government entity. This is an independent government entity. So when I say independent, it means that we have been, we have more like a mind of our own, but housed under the government. So we are trying to bridge the gap between the government and the communities, the marginalized communities primarily. They, they need the help. They need the people to act as bridges, to, to be a conduit to resources for people. Uh, and, and you have to be a trusted resource. Exactly. You know, so I, I can appreciate that work. Um, thank you for mentioning. Absolutely. So one of the things, and I mean, we're probably getting towards the end of the conversation. And I always like when, I always like this part because this is one of my favorite questions, which is my last question, because we're going to look into the future. So I'm going to give you the question and you just tell me what you think. Angela, what do you think, sense and feel for Maine's black future? Oh, I see so much prosperity, provided we continue on the path that we are in. I could actually uh, use uh, Martin Luther King, who said, if you can't, can't, can't run, run, you, you walk. walk. If, if you, you can't, can't walk, walk, you, you crawl. crawl, provided you're not at the same spot. There is movement. So the main of two, three, four, five years ago is obviously not the same main that we have today. So the fact that there is a lot of conversations going on, I think conversation is a very good, valid change. It brings change a lot because it brings about education, awareness, and it keeps people conscious. Even when people are awake, it keeps them conscious of, you know, the awareness. And I think that is a very good thing that we are at the point where we are talking about issues, real issues in our community. We have so many strong people of color, black, brown, men and women doing so much magic in this state and I'm grateful too that we have a lot of white allies who are not just educating themselves and keeping themselves aware but also who are actually doing the work and yes. supporting the efforts of the marginalized communities and we are always grateful for them so I believe that provided we continue on this path yeah. I see me that's really great. Absolutely. Man, I see that too. And what I want to do here is just say, really shout out all the allies, true allies, bold, 
allies that support people like us and make Maine more into the place that we all need to be. That being said, I really have enjoyed talking to you, Angela, and just hanging out in the studio. Stay tuned for more information. Check the show notes because we're going to have a lot of links there for you to follow up, learn about Angela and other things that Genius has going on. And again, just shout out all the allies as well as all the black and brown people inside the state of Maine. And remember, you have been listening to Maine's Black Future.